to be or not to be? That is the question. Williams Shakespeare. The crack sack killer. The crack sack killer. This story takes place in Washington State along what they now call International Boulevard that used to be called Pacific Highway. In 1998, I had an encounter with the Green River Killer. He tried to choke me. I remembered that day. And I also remember that serial killers like Highways. This is a story about a year in the life of a serial killer. I have been the crack sack killer. The story starts in Washington State between Tacoma and Seattle, Washington. There is a highway that will take you to both. Pacific Highway or International Boulevard. Some of the most notorious serial killers of Washington State has preyed upon victims. Ted Bundy. Gary Lee Ridgeway. Pacific Highway or International Boulevard is a spectacular hunting ground. People that are often addicted to drugs, prostitution, People that have strayed away from their loved ones for one reason or another. They have no nine to five to appear at. They have no class schedule or curriculum. These people are addicts and they use drugs and they move and they wiggle for drugs. They wake up for drugs. They go to sleep for drugs. They have sex for drugs. If they have to get dressed up all the way, it is because it is a con to get more drugs. Now, I met a guy back in August 2022, and he lived off of the Pacific Highway. I met this particular guy coming from work as I was working contracted work diligently trying to pursue my own business as I got back up to Washington State 
I lived with my aunt, who also lived off of Pacific Highway. Now, this guy, he said that he lived in the Mary Posey apartment. And I sent him on the bus, and he had use to rent. He said, if you ever want to buy something, just let me know. Now, the A-line bus is a free bus that runs down the highway. It is International Highway. And it passes the airport, so you're going to get people that are touring tourism. Uh, you're going to get, again, your drug activity, your prostitution activity, and a lot of traffic flow. So this is the highway. Now, they have a bus here in Washington State that rides you up and down the highway for free. That's right, people. It runs all the way throughout the night. I believe it, it stops running at 4 a.m. for two hours, and then it starts right back at 6 a.m. Even at 4 a.m. is shift change. Officers, everybody, shift change. But 4 a.m. to 2 a.m., no buses. Now, I also believe that because of incidents previously on this bus that they have cameras. Now, it doesn't stop people from doing drugs, from uh, touching their cells and doing um, all sorts of things that probably should not be done in a public place. So they smoke booze, pills, and cocaine, and drink, and so obviously there is a lot of the homeless population on those buses because when it gets cold outside, this is a free ride, there's heat, you're moving and breathing until you can come up with something, somewhere to go safe. Now, as I meet this guy, I explain to him that I am in the process of starting my own business and I'm doing contract work. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to even stay in the state because I have business outside of the state that I have to attend to. I explained to him that I work in the night time, so I'm working these night shifts. And I really I don't even sleep at night. In the morning time, I come in and I get some sleep and then I'll get right back up and go back out. So he said, well, I'm looking for a roommate. And I said, hmm. I said, well, how much are you looking to, to, to rent your room out for. He said, well, I'm already getting assistance because I'm on this program. He said, I have mental illness. You know, I, I talk to people that. So I said, well, how much are you renting me for? Because I work and, and I'm getting paid and, and it's not a, a, a full-time job. This is contract work and I get paid. So I can pay you like in the next two days if you tell me how much you want. So he said, look, well, you pay me 150 bucks. And I thought to myself, that's awfully cheap because we're in Washington State and things are expensive. But he explained to me that someone else was paying his rent and he had to pay even and his rent was going to get paid. So I said, well, that's fine. I stepped away. He said, yeah, just buy some food. I said, well, sure. I have no problem with that. I love to eat. I cook good meals. I said, I like two warm meals a day. That's just how I like it. So anyhow, I had some stuff at the storage that I wasn't sure if I was going to pull out or not because I had just came back into town. But I went to work. And I worked that night. And I came back to his apartment the next day in the morning. When I came back, oh, I was tired. All I really wanted to do was go to sleep, been up all night. So he explained to me that, hey, you can go to sleep. He's going to leave. He said, I'm leaving. I'm taking off. I said, well, I don't have all your money, but I'll have it tomorrow. He said, that's fine. And I said, well, when you come back, if you don't come back in the evening, I'm going to be gone again. I'll be going to work again because I leave and I'll be out all night. So I'll see you in the morning. And he explained to me, he said, well, 
I just want you to know I don't have a key to my place. Somebody had my key. He said, but the door will be open. He said he was going downtown to handle some business. Now, I could see that he was obviously on some Schedule 3 drugs or something to that effect. However, his apartment was somewhat decent, but you could see there was no electronics or anything inside of the place. And so, uh, he was erratic. And he said, uh, do you, what do you do? I said, I don't do nothing. I smoke weed. I don't do crack. I don't want to crack around me. It make my eyes puffy. I don't mess with it. I said, my mom used to do drugs. He gives me all kinds of trauma. Please don't do it around me. He said, well, I'm going to leave. He said, you can stay here. He said, nobody should come here. He said, I got no key to the door. He said, but it's this one guy that I call a nephew, and every now and then he'll come. So if nephew comes, because he comes, and sometimes I guess nephew might be looking out for him, you know, giving this whatever he needs. He said, if nephew comes, don't answer the door, just, you know, don't worry about it. I said, okay. So then, that day, he stayed out again. I didn't know where he was the other nights, because again, I was at the stadium working. So... The next day he came and I said, here, I gave him his money. He said, oh, you really gave me money? Oh, you, you're real cool for that. You good? You a good girl. You right? And I gave him a pack of cigarettes. He was asking for some cigarettes, you know. I had a few bucks. I said, okay, I'm going to go get some food. I'm going to take some food to work with me when I work. So we went to the grocery store. And I put some food in the house because there wasn't any food in the house. And I need food, and I need soap, and I had all my other stuff. So I said, okay. So I said, oh. What uh, else do you need for your house? You know, I was trying to be kind. I said, maybe we should get some toilet rugs. Because I seen his bathroom, and we had come, and I cooked everything. That's the way I needed, and I need some toilet rugs. So I went and got some bleach and some throw rags. And went to the dollar store. Now, when we went to the dollar store, I noticed some girl, well, he might have known because they had said hi, you know. And uh, the next day, there was a knock on the door. And the person who was calling nephew came, he said it's not his real nephew. But he came in. And the man, you know, he has the money in his pocket. And so I will refer to uh, the person who I was staying with, the guy who I met. We're going to refer to him throughout the story as the crack sack killer. Now, the crack sack killer had money in his pocket because I gave him some money for staying And the nephew or who he was calling his nephew, but not his real nephew, had came in. So I don't know if his nephew had with the cracks, you know, some crack or whatever, who knows. But the point is, at that point I was really uncomfortable because I don't know either one of these guys and, um, you know, they, 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 they're dealing with deals and, and I don't want them thinking that I'm a part of any of those deals. So, the cracks that kill says to nephew, you can stay here. Now nephew's here. Now I'm here. Now he said, I'm about to go downtown. I gotta go. And I believe he had to go get his car, he said. He had to go pick up his car. He had gave someone downtown Seattle his bank card. You know, like as collateral. So anyway... When he goes, he goes for a couple more days. And he's gone. And the next day, I had to go to work. So I told nephew. Now I got a few of my things inside his place, but not too much worth anything because obviously he's on drugs and there's no electronics in the place. But I says to him, I says, when I come back, I'm going to be real tired. Do you know if you're going to be here? Because... Cracks that kill, he keep running back and forth, back and forth. I don't know where he gonna be from day to day. 
but the door is supposed to be open, but that's when I was in there by myself. Now I'm working at the stadium in some different hours. So now the nephew boy says, okay, that's cool. I'll be here. I'll be here when you come back. I'll stay here. Stick around for you to come back. So, come back from the stadium. And I'm going to be all night. Now, I am like located midway to Seattle. And the stadium district is downtown Seattle. And downtown Seattle is pretty much a whole other city. And this is where the crack sack killer goes. Uh, to cop most of his his crack so now he's out maybe for another two days so now two or three weeks have passed and I really haven't seen the crack sack killer but nephew's been there for about two or three days so now the crack sack killer comes back in now he tells nephew that I'm not his roommate, I'm his girlfriend. Don't say nothing to his girlfriend. Now, I ain't say nothing because, you know, I need somewhere to stay, but, you know. Anyhow, the next day, he asked nephew for some crack. Now, if nephew ain't got nowhere to stay for whatever, he wants to stay for a few days. I don't know if he gave him some more. But that got him started again. And nephew said, well, you know, he leaves. And he comes back with some liquor and a girl. Now, when he comes back with the girl, the girl kind of favored me, single me, baby. But just a little bit smaller and younger than I. And uh, the crack sack killer gets mad and says, why are you bringing this sour hole up in here? Right. So obviously they all knew each other, but I, I, I thought nothing of it. So... And then about an hour or so after that, I get up, because I'm about to get ready and go to work. But I cook something, because I'm hungry and I'm going to take it to work. So I got dressed, and they, they're out in the front room, and they're doing their thing, and I'm staying in the back. Because I don't do it, and so I close the door, whatever they're doing, and they do. Now, after I get done, I'm about to wrap my food up. I go out into the kitchen to get the, wrap the food up. And then the crack sack killer is gonna get in the bathtub. He been out for some. So when he gets in, nephew start arguing. I don't know what happened. But we've been together on these buses. Because when I get to the stadium district, I show the crack sack killer how to get an ID because he don't have no ID on him. And I showed him how to go and do this contract work. So he says, I, I don't know if you lost respect for me because him and the boy he called nephew had got into it. He said, but I'm going to work and I'm going to get off crack because I really want to be your man. I see that you, that nephew took a liking to you and I don't want you to choose him. I want you to choose me. This is what the crack sack killer says. So he goes and gets his ID. He said, I'm putting crack down. And he goes and he signs up to go to work to do the contract work. And he starts doing contract work. He was working along the side of me when they scheduled me, they'll schedule him. And he'll go in there and he'll work. And he'll do the grain guys with me. Now, when we go back, mind you, we're in the same apartment complex, right? And he said he don't want no crack. He do not want no parts of the crack. Now, in between him getting his job, the first day or two, he didn't have a phone because he sells his phone. So now he's going to go ahead and open up. He said, the reason why nephew did me like that is because I had a hard life. He said, I've been on crack for years and years and years. He said, when I do it, I sell everything I got. He said, that he take all, everything he got. He can take your clothes off of him. And he'll sell that too. He said, that he starts masturbating outside when he gets on crack right in the public he takes it and blows it out in the open and starts masturbating and looking at 
porn. He said that's what he likes to do. So I didn't find that too abnormal for a man to like to get high off a girl to masturbate as much as he said he did it out in public. That was peculiar. Nevertheless, I wasn't interested to that degree and in that manner. So I pretty much allowed him to ramble on and to do whatever he needed to do while being there. I had made the decision that the guy and I already said he's crazy. So if I just continued to listen to him talk crazy, that would drive me crazy. So I would just let him talk and really kind of, sort of, not pay it any mind. But then one day we started talking about a, a girl that we knew. And I, I said, oh, is that the same uh, girl? You know, because you kept saying her name. And I said, well, I know a girl named Nina. And he knew a girl named Nina. But I kept on mentioning my Nina. And he kept on saying, well, she knows these people too. Maybe it's our same Nina. But then he went into the story about how he used to date Nina and, and Nina was real good to him. But then one day he went to jail for a long time because he put his hands on Nina and Nina said he was trying to put his hands on a kid. So I said, oh, well, I don't know if that's the same Nina because you know, I ain't seen her since we was young, you know. So... I said, well, what did you do? Because they, they said they wanted to put him in there for four years. And I said, well, what did you do to me? And he said that she said that she tried. He tried to choke her and hold her kids hostage. Now, I, 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 I brushed over it, but I ain't brushed over it because I got to come back to it now. Remember my experience with the choking. So, I brushed over it, but I, I remembered it. Now, right when we're working, we get news from his caseworker that they have found his daughter. And this happened to be, oh, November. And they said that the daughter had been found deceased. And so, this caseworker had been calling him while I was up in the house. And I was listening to the caseworker. And the caseworker had called and said that some girl that he had knew, I don't know if he was fooling around with in the past, had been even calling the caseworker looking for him. But remember, he had, his phone was gone. He didn't have no phone. He was using my phone. That's why he was going to work. But he had had a new phone. So he, they was calling the old number. And they was calling, trying to reach out. They've been calling. They've been calling for almost a month. They need to speak to him to know if he knows that what had happened to his daughter. So the world went on and passed it along to the case manager. The case manager said, I think it's something about your daughter. But as he laid there, he acted nonchalant and said he did not want to talk to that girl. And he told his case manager she probably making it up. Later on, we found out that the daughter was deceased. And we found out one day before her service. We ended up going to her service. The crack sack killer did not cry one drip drop. He didn't even want me to mention it. Now, they had had a memorial after her service for the homeless and people that were found dead downtown and he didn't want to attend that either. So I didn't push it any further because people do it in their own way. But I found it peculiar. I found it peculiar that he got rid of his phone. I found it peculiar that he would not answer the phone calls. I found it peculiar that he wouldn't answer the girl's phone calls. And I found it peculiar that he didn't cry when he found out that his daughter was deceased. 
Now, what made it more strange is that the circumstances of his daughter being deceased were questionable, could be foul play. Um, she was found deceased in her vehicle. Now, the girl, he reaches back out to the girl after his daughter's service that we attended. The girl that kept calling. And then he disappears for two or three days. I think he leaves on a Friday. When he comes back, he's pissed off. And I said, what did she say? He said, I wanted to know what she could find out about my daughter and if something else had happened with my daughter. And he started saying there was another guy there. I told her there was another guy. Now, what he had said and mentioned in their conversation as I was sitting next to him was that they were with his daughter, him and her, right before the daughter was deceased when they took the dates. Then they said, right, so we were just with her. So she's steady saying what she don't want to hear. See, she left them and the crack sack killer and his daughter were together. And now the daughter was dead. She also seen that he was avoiding her calls. And he could have used me as an alibi for avoiding his calls. That I got a new girlfriend, I got a new girlfriend, that's why I want to talk to her. Anyhow, this puts us in about, oh, the end of November. So now we are heading into December. Now, in December, I still don't know him much because, he, again, I work, and now he's starting to work, and now something traumatic has happened, now that he's stopped his binge for a minute, I'm trying to figure it out. So now, December 2nd, we are Lumen. Lumen is a football film, we are working on Lumen. And we are trying to make money because I said, well, you know, we can give back. But when we are Lumen, he argues with the man. And he tells me not to come back and to give him his key back. Because he's mad. Because he's telling me don't talk to nobody. He's ready to touch me physically, put his hands on me. And the guy is saying, no way. So, I leave. And I start walking on down here. And he says, give me my key, give me my key. So I'm ready to give his key back. But I ended up going back. After the long ride back to Federal Way to his house in the wee hours of the morning. When we get into his house, he is agitated because he's arguing with the dude about me. Now, the next day, he sees that my friend keeps calling and I say, hey, I make music with this dude. And you know what I'm saying? I let him listen to a couple of songs that we had made. And I said that because, you know, they understood I make music. And, and, and the crack sack killer says, oh. So the dude, he said, hey, I just, I was uh, I was away for a minute and uh, they got my car. And can you take me to go and get my car out of town? So I told the crack sack killer who was at his house. We got in the car. We went to go meet him. Now, when we meet him, he notices that the guy sees that I'm the one that's up in this relationship. He says, this dude got to be on some dope, on some drugs, on something. So now, he picks up on that. So now the crack sack killer is acting like this guy is up. And we're going to call this guy Forrest. And Forrest sees that now the guy is grooming him. He sees so that he could put me down. He don't want Forrest to pick up on everything. Now, 
Now, after a few days, I am about ready uh, to see if he's ready to go to the next level with his sobriety. But what I'm finding out is that every night he sneaks out of his house in his apartment complex. Now, it's a younger guy across the breezeway, and I'm not sure if he's giving him crack or what have you. But in the wee hours, he goes outside. He leaves. So, at 1 o'clock, he'll get up and he'll leave. And so, I don't know if he was going. Where was he going? He said, I got to go wash. I got to go to the laundry room. And the laundry room is in the complex, but you got to go outside your house. Now, I noticed that the young guy, he'd be out all sorts of wee hours as well. So, I wasn't really sure what was going on. But in December, I began to notice that pattern of in the wee hours of the night, he would say he had to go do laundry and would leave the actual apartment. Now, it started to get to me. Because I felt like, okay, he's probably going somewhere to smoke crack or whatever else he could be doing. So, when I felt like he wasn't going to stop smoking the crack, I told him that it was really unnecessary for him to expect for me to believe him. And when I started talking like that, he started acting like I was all the way crazy. Now by the end of December, someone in the complex has shot a bullet through the window. He is paranoid. Mind you, he smokes crack and I'm not sure if it's a cold or current disorder he has, but he goes all out about how these people are coming to get him. They got the laser playing at him. Um, it is very intense to the degree that if somebody is experiencing so much trauma that you could be in harm's way in an immediate danger from this paranoia and this fixation or this delusion that they are experiencing. Now, I'm the only person in his house. Now, this is before the new year. Now, his case manager that he had for so long that claimed he knew him, I had called her up and I said, look, I'm not sure of what's going on, but um, I feel bad for leaving him because he just lost his daughter and his grief. But I can't even sit up in here uh, with just me and him up in here. I don't feel safe. I don't feel right. And so the case manager at the time, we're going to call her Virgin. Virgin says, Don't worry. He's never hurt anyone. He just raises his voice. So, next, moving right along, it's a, another girl. We're going to call her Snagger. Snagger sells crack and goes in and out of the Mary Posey apartments and selling crack to people and goes up and down Pacific Highway and that's what she does. And so Snagger seen us together on this bus ride but Snagger knows him and Snagger knows that at night time he come out him and her get together and they do whatever they do. So after the bill, I said, I'm going to take a little break. So I went on and left and went to my family's house. And I believe him and Snagger started hanging out for a little while. 
because they would go to the laundry room while I was up in the house. And so now she would be able to come in the house. And so they were smoking and they, and, and he was seeing how he kept trying with me and how I was getting on his nerves and how he going to be able to hold his head up with me. Because at this point, I, I'm seeing too many coincidences and too many patterns and too many behaviors. And so I thought, I said, well, whoever the girl is that's at the laundry room that y'all go in the back of the bushes with at night time, you might as well have her come on up in here. I'm going to get on the box where right? because you're grown and you ain't got you ain't got to be sneaking off and doing those things. So I left. And uh, I pretty much at that point moved all of my things and all my belongings up out of his apartment complex. Now, every two or three days he'll call me and want to see me. He'll call me, he have this for me, come get that. So I'll go over there, but not to stay. Now, now that I'm not over there, he's starting to find out that people are hearing about people coming up missing. So they haven't found anyone, but it's the guy that he said was missing when I first met him, then found his body. And he was supposed to be with some girl or young girl, they should be down at the fountain in Pioneer Square. Now it's December and now he's staying in, he's being put because he ain't heard that bit of information. They were saying that he was dead. People start calling his phone trying to see if it was him. Because they have found his body. So I do believe that after that he started staying put and really not wanting to go downtown to the downtown area where he always frequent. By May 26, the neighbor is asking about uh, the girl that they say I look like. The girl that they say I look like been missing since February. Now the girl who they say I look like been missing since February. See, February 14th was Valentine's Day and that was the day that he was supposed to start a new job downtown Seattle. Now the girl who they say I look like is the same girl that Matthew had brought over that he was seeing was so sour and stinky and why you bring her over. They're saying that this girl is missing now. And the neighbor who lives right next door across the breezeway is asking him what happened to her now that you didn't replace her with me. This is where he's asking the cracks I kill. Now I heard him say that. I heard the neighbor say that. And they closed the door. Now, May 28th, or May 12th, excuse me, I speak with Forrest, who we do the music together. And Forrest says that he's on the bus and he's catching the bus because they was going to do some rhymes together. He was catching the bus to crack out Kira's house. Now, I talked to him on the phone and he was saying that if I knew anybody uh, that wanted uh, booze or pills see I believe that the crack sack killer had murdered the girl and had, had drugs from then so that they would keep the crack and the blues because he wouldn't have anything. He wouldn't have any money. We'd have to go to the pawn shop to put on the TV. 
he didn't have money, but when I would come back, he would have all these drugs. He would have the drugs, and his drug of choice was crack cocaine, but he'd have whatever drugs they had on, whoever had it, whoever he had got, whatever drugs they had on, he had all of their drugs. This, he was fierce. I began to look for languages and triggers and patterns. Whenever he starts saying, motherfucker, motherfucker, he starts biting down on his bottom lip, motherfucker, that means he was going to come for you. And so, I did not know exactly what extent he would go to, but I knew that he would go to extremes. He had already pretty much said that he would do anything, he would do sexual acts, he would lick ass, drink piss, drink, eat shit, do whatever. That's right, eat feces, drink urine, do whatever. He was strung out. And he said that people would say, would you ever start smoking crack? Would you start smoking crack for God? They make all kinds of statements. To him about his drug use and the behavior that was displayed. So now he gets Forrest over there and he's telling Forrest, Look, look what I got, look what I got. I came up, I had a lick. Now Forrest is calling around trying to see if somebody wants something, whatever, who knows. But, the next door neighbor boy is trying to see who, who's who and what's going on. But he wants to do a trade. So he wants to trade. The crack sack killer wants to trade these blue pills for some crack. Because that's what he wants from the neighbor. Now, the neighbor do the trade, but the neighbor want to know who else is up in the place, but he ain't got no neighbor in the place. So then when he go back out to get some more, they meet outside. And I do believe that he murdered the neighbor that night in the car in the neighbor's car and then went back in the house and Forrest was still in the house with him and if they was partying, if they was doing whatever the next morning when they leave Forrest leaves and sees the old boy, the neighbor, in his car and said, oh, that nigga was knocked out or said something to that effect so well now, the crack sack killer feels like man force is they, and when, when they see that this boy is gone, force is gone over that time, so now he gotta get force. Now the boy, the neighbor see that I wasn't with him, so he was trying to see who was up in that house. Cause the neighbor had seen me on, on the, the, the one line train earlier that day. So he seen that the crack sack killer had somebody in his house and he'll never have no money unless I'm around him. So where is he getting blues or any of this from? You know, that's what the neighbor's questioning. Now, when they leave the next morning together, they get on the bus. The bus has cameras. Force is seen on the bus and the bus cameras show force being seen on the bus. Forrest is also being seen leaving and pinpointed at the Mary Posey apartments by witnesses that say that he was there at Mary Posey apartments. How do we know? Because almost a month later in August Police finds, like two, three weeks later, sometime in August, police finds the neighbor's body sitting in the car. The neighbor's been sitting out in the car dead. So they're trying to find a time of death timeline. 
So they start asking questions and start trying to ask questions about this body and then they realize that Forrest was at this apartment complex. The Forrest ain't been seen either. So is Forrest on the line? Did Forrest, did Forrest do something to the neighbor in the car? Forrest, I believe, left with the crack sack killer from the Mary Posey apartments. And I believe that the crack sack killer killed his neighbor while Forrest was inside of the crack sack killer's apartment. And when they walked out, Forrest seen that the neighbor was either asleep or something and mentioned it to where the crack sack killer then felt intimidated, threatened, got on the bus, because the camera showed that Forrest was on the bus, and I believe that he got off the bus and got on what we call the one-line train. And this train ends at Angle Lake and takes you to North Gate, Seattle. So it takes you into Federal Way all the way to the north part of Seattle, um, the north of, of Federal Way in the north part of the city. So now we have the man at the fountain gone, the daughter and her car gone, the girl who they say looked like me, who was with nephew, gone. When the neighbor mentions that that girl is gone, because he sees her frequent, then all of a sudden the neighbor is found dead in his car, and he's gone. Then when they see that it was some dude, because Forrest don't live there, so maybe it was him, yeah, we ain't seen this dude's face. So when the officers go to go question Forrest, they can't find Forrest. Now Forrest is gone. Now, remember Snagger. Snagger sells crack uh, to the crack sack killer, and that she probably do sexual acts and do stuff. But she, he had sat there and he was pouring his heart out about how he was a good guy and how I wasn't treating him right and I wasn't the woman for him. Now, he was hoping that Snagger would stay with him because at this point he needs somebody to stay there with him because he's done so much. So, for three days, Snagger stays with him because that's how long the boat lasts. Snagger don't do crack. Snagger sell crack to do her blues. She does pills. But he, she, he didn't have no pills. But he wanted some more crack from Snagger while she was while they were sitting there partying. So what he did was he went back out to that car, I do believe. Three days later, however long Snagger was there, went and got those pills that he knew he had traded with the neighbor and gave those pills to Snagger and Snagger gave him some more crap. Now, I had left and been out of the picture because I had just started my site, my website, and I went drinking and I had a fall. So I had went to the, the doctors in the ER, but I hadn't been back on the one line in Angle Lake since then. So, when I didn't get back on there, it was because they needed to see who it was that was on that one line train. I felt some sort of kind of way. I did not see cameras on the Angle Lake one line.
on train. However, there's cameras on the A-Line free bus. The A-Line also seen Snagger get off at the Mary Posey apartments. But Snagger's missing too, and the A-Line didn't see her get back on. See, these cameras are on the bus, and the cameras don't see her getting back on the bus, but it sees her getting off the bus right in front of the Mary Posey apartments. Now, he called me out of the blue, oh, the mid part of August, and, or excuse me, the mid part of June, and he says to me, I'm going into treatment. That, I guess that's his way to linger me, to linger me back in. He says, I'm going into treatment. I got to go into treatment. I, 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 I picked up new charges. He's still scattered. He's been on a spree. He's been on a spree. Ever since February 16th. He has been schizophrenic, all over the place, sporadic, and very much impulsive. He has had, had way too many people found dead around him. What I'm afraid is that people say they OD, that he's really choking them and strangling them and stabbing them and bludgeoning them. And when I can believe that he has murdered his own daughter and he has murdered his own mother. See? Well, I can believe that. Then the crack sack killer is vicious. The crack sack killer is cold hearted. There are many people that are found missing downtown. More importantly, there is a cold case that screams to be reopened. An investigation into his baby mother's death, Tia Hicks. And they're trying to piece together her final months. I believe he murdered Tia Hicks back in 1991. The mother of his two children. I believe he murdered and choked his own mother when she questioned him about his involvement in this Tia Hicks murder. Adretta Jones and this has been a year in the life of the crack sack killer. You all be safe.
as of today, the crack sack killer is still at 